Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this today's webinar. Thank you so much for being here. I am Joseph Noalard. I am a researcher and a technician on projects on the Observatory for Debt and Globalization, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar on hydrogen. First, I'll give you a brief introduction on how we will run today's webinar, and then I will go through the content and I will introduce the different speakers we have with us today. So firstly and foremost, I'd like to say that in today's webinar, we have simultaneous interpretation into Spanish and English. To access the interpretation, you must click on the globe icon on the bottom right hand side of your Zoom screen. There it says interpretation and you can select the language of your choice. And this information is also available in the chat in case you need to refer back to it. I'd also like to say that today's webinar is part of a series of webinars called It's Raining Green Hallelujah. And it's part of a European project called Cities in Observatory for Green Deal Financing, which is a campaign led by several European organizations to demand greater transparency and a fair distribution of EU funds in general, and more concretely for these funds to contribute to a green transition, yes, but also a fair transition. This is the second webinar of the three that are part of this cycle. As you know, today's webinar on hydrogen, the protagonist of the energy transition. The first webinar, which was held last week, is available on our YouTube channel in the different languages, uh, when we also had a simultaneous interpretation. And I'd also like to say that the third webinar will be next week, but it'll be on Thursday, the 1st of June at 5.30 p.m. And According to latest inform information on how today's webinar will function, if, as you know, we have a chat box and we will write in the chat box with the more technical aspects of the webinar and you can uh, also send in your questions through the chat and if you want to introduce yourselves using the chat function, you can indicate your name, your country, and the name of your organization. And if you have questions on a political content, then you have another function that is a Q&A where you can send in your questions, and once we've ended with the interventions, we will allow the speakers to respond. Having said that, what we will do next is we will play a video that we've published today, which precisely has to do with hydrogen, uh, explaining what hydrogen is and explaining the role played by hydrogen in the energy transition and the role that we think hydrogen should play. I'm sure you've all heard of green hydrogen. As green and digital technologies are considered the technological solutions to the ecological crisis, green hydrogen will have an important role as an energetic solution. Considering the public funds being used in the production of green hydrogen, it seems the European Union is being seduced by the hydrogen lobby's discourse. The lobbies say that we will be able to substitute all fossil energy with green hydrogen without changing a tiny shred of our system of production. But hang on a sec. What is hydrogen? First of all, we must stress that hydrogen is not an energy resource. Wait, what? It's an energy carrier. Hmm. It stores energy like a battery. So you won't just 
dig under the soil and find hydrogen. You still need an energy source to produce it. If you produce it with renewable energies, they say, we can call it green. If not, wow. So is green hydrogen truly that green? Not exactly. First, we need to consider the fact that renewable technologies also have impacts. Green hydrogen is produced with a lot of water in zones that are in a water stress situation like the Mediterranean region or the Antofagasta region in Chile. Consider this, to generate a ton of green hydrogen, nine tons of water are needed. Also, hydrogen has a low energy efficiency. It requires a lot of energy and resources to be produced. As stated in the Repower EU strategy, Chile is a strategic partner of the European Union in fostering green hydrogen. And that way, the EU can end their dependency on Russian fossil fuels. And this, of course, comes with big ecological costs. The process of desalinating water is jeopardizing ecosystems and local communities, as well as polluting the seawater and the air. Let's have a listen to this woman from Pueblo Chango. La industria ya están eh, llegando a nuestro territorio para quedarse. Y lamentablemente el impacto que va a producir va a ser nuestros recursos, en nuestra forma de vivir, en nuestra salud. Yo le diría a los europeos que no confíen tanto en este mega mega proyecto del hidrógeno verde y que vean la realidad. La realidad en la costa de los chilenos. Nosotros dependemos 100% del recurso del mar y al no tener ese recurso How will this hydrogen infrastructure be financed? The Next Generation EU, which funds part of the European Green Deal, is the main candidate. Spain can receive a lot of money from this fund. 160 billion, not bad. Where over 10 billion are for the energy transition. At this point, we know that big fossil companies like Repsol, Cepsa, Enel, and Iberdrola have received public money from these funds to develop hydrogen projects. When we know that some of these companies have had record high profits in 2022. These companies are putting a lot of pressure on the European Union to promote new hydrogen infrastructures such as the H2 Med a mega infrastructure to transport hydrogen from Portugal to the rest of Europe. This is just one of many planned hydrogen mega infrastructures. So what should we do? We need to get rid of the idea that we can simply replace fossil gas with green hydrogen because, as was said, it's very difficult to produce and comes with a lot of costs. It is also necessary to decide in a democratic manner and based on a well-grounded analysis, which social needs we can and want to cover with green hydrogen. We need to focus on substituting hydrogen produced by fossil fuels to hydrogen produced by renewable energies and using this energy carrier to foster the industries related to the ecological transition. Moreover, people and communities' energy needs have to be accomplished through local and community-based infrastructures. We need to reduce our energy consumption and reconsider our social and political structures as well as our economic model. We need to walk towards degrowth economies focused on well-being rather than on expanding economies. And I think you guessed it, while respecting the planetary boundaries. Okay, so after having watched this video, I'll explain the key ideas we saw in this video. First, the importance that technology solutions play for the green um, energy transition, including hydrogen, and they are telling us they want to replace fossil fuels through this energy vector, but they're not questioning whether we should change the consumption model we have today 
It's also important to say that hydrogen isn't an energy resource like fossil fuels, but it's an energy storage system and you need energy to produce hydrogen. And depending on the energy that is used, it'll be given one color or another. We must also bear in mind how green hydrogen has been uh, boosted through the repower EU strategy to stop being dependent on Russian fossil fuel. And they are focusing on the production of this hydrogen in peripheral areas because so that the center of Europe can supply its industry with green energy. And that is what we are trying to focus on or want to focus on in this webinar. We want to talk in the case of Spain um, and at the European level, Spain would be the biggest hydrogen producer and would then carry it to the center of Europe. And as we saw in the video, another country that is highly relevant for the production of hydrogen to then export it is Chile. And that is why we have three speakers this afternoon. As you, I'm sure you've seen in the flyer, I will introduce each of them and then I'll give them the floor for their presentations. First, we have Marina Gross from Ecologistas en Acción. She is a biotechnologist by training and has been monitoring uh, global governance and public policies since 2008. And she's uh, in charge of the gas campaign in Ecologistas en Acción and a campaigner for energy and climate in this same organization. We also have Natalia Luege from Sustentarse. She has a BA in art and has a master's degree in territorial and environmental sustainability. She has also experience in several fields such as social and environmental sustainability, focused on working with communities on political um, energy and she's focused on free and on fair energy transition and she collaborates with the regional council of the Chango people in the region of Antofagasta. And then last but not least, we have Marcelo Silva, who is a regional councillor of the Chango people in Antofagasta. And he's also a fish person and a artisanal gather and the president of the Association of Fishermen at Greta Agetos, where he lives. Thank you all for being here. I will start off by asking Marina Gross uh, three questions. I will ask each of the panelists three questions. They will give a presentation and then we'll have a round of questions so that you can ask your questions from the audience. So first, Marina, what is the role played by hydrogen in the Spanish and EU energy transitional proposal. Is there a European and a Spanish strategy to develop green hydrogen? The second question is, what are the actors involved? How will this development of hydrogen be funded? And could you give us names of concrete projects that are being highlighted? What are the main impacts that are foreseeable from green and hydrogen projects in Spain or in Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josep, and thanks to the ODG for hosting these uh, series of very interesting webinars. It's a pleasure sharing space with Natalia and Marcelo to see the similar patterns that we can identify in Spain and in Chile in light of this, the green hydrogen bubble. Just to give us all some background, at a European level, we had the European Green Deal, which set out a goal of renewable hydrogen for 2030. And after the onset of the war in Ukraine, the European Union came up with some plans and mechanisms to stop depending on Russian gas as quickly as possible. We could say a lot about this repower EU, this plan that was started. But if we focus on green hydrogen, 
we can see how it's double the target in terms of production of green hydrogen within the European Union and green hydrogen imports. And this is very important for what comes after. It also allows for new funding mechanisms with specific funds for the development of green hydrogen projects. And it allows member states to include in their resilience and transformation plan in the next generation EU funds, which come from the recovery of the COVID pandemic to use, the states can use these funds and then rewrite the chapters of the national plans to adapt them to the new situation. So we hope the Spanish state may rewrite these chapters and focus them on the green hydrogen, but it would also allow them to focus on the promotion of gas projects or other matters that don't have to comply with the principle of not causing significant harm, which was the only environmental clause governing these funds. Now, one of the main points we see is that we believe these targets are overdimensioned, they're hyped up. It's not just us saying this, there are studies such as this, published recently by Agora, which tries analyzing the repowering EU and comparing it to a scenario of uh, phasing out gas. And through this analysis, they reach the conclusion that the target for green hydrogen are hyped up. Uh, you just need one fifth of what they mentioned. And this is highly significant, both when it comes to domestic production, but also when we look at the needs to import green hydrogen from other countries outside the European Union. I also wanted to highlight the relevance of transport infrastructure, both for gas and hydrogen. They are closely interlinked. In the image on your left, you see a map published in the Repower EU plan where you see gas projects that would fall under EU funding for the community interest projects that are uh, funded by the EU for their development. And then we see new projects linked to gas, which in the future could also be used for green hydrogen. And we also see how all of these hydrogen corridors, which appear well-defined uh, on the map, they are also included in this first picture of the Repower EU on the image on the right. However, we have the proposals made by the companies in charge of transporting gas. They are also the companies that aim at transporting hydrogen. And they developed a whole set of infrastructures to store and transport hydrogen which would be focusing on, uh, they'd be requesting funds from the PCIs. Uh, and we can look at the case of Spain later on. As I was saying, one of the main points is this overarching goal in the Repower EU in terms of gas, uh, hydrogen imports. It can be dangerous because they keep alive the neo-colonial dynamics between the North and South, but also within the European Union, we have seen Spain announcing itself as the exporting hub of green hydrogen for the European Union. And this is dangerous because the production of green hydrogen could take that renewable energy that could be used for the domestic needs in the country to decarbonize the energy system. And instead of it being used for this, it would be used to produce green hydrogen and to export green hydrogen. I wanted to also point out a study by Tiani and Theo, public, TNI and Theo published last year when the Repower EU was published, looking at the potential impacts that these high targets for 
the imports of green hydrogen could have in the countries of Northern Africa, Morocco, Algeria, and Egypt. So it can lead to strong impact when it comes to the energy transition in these countries. At the same time, there'd be a huge energy loss, not just from the production of green hydrogen, as we saw in the video, but also be, we lose energy from transporting energy. If the hydrogen is to be transported on vessels as liquid hydrogen, you need three times more energy to turn hydrogen liquid because it's a very small molecule that requires a lot of energy. And they carry less energy than gas. And if we want to carry hydrogen through pipelines with existing pipelines, you need either a greater cost to adapt all of that infrastructure, which today isn't prepared to carry hydrogen, and also greater problems or issues of hydrogen that could escape. So we'd be in light of a situation where we would lose energy through the transportation. And then if the targets are very high and difficult to achieve, we must also bear in mind that green hydrogen, even if there's a lot being said about it, is still a very new technology, which is still being developed. It's still being scaled up. So if we have over ambitious targets uh, in terms of what we can really achieve, we run the risk that they may introduce other types of hydrogen produced in non-renewable ways. This opens the door to large energy, fossil fuel energy companies to play the game and the risk is very high in the countries in Northern Africa. Which is one of the main gas exporters in Northern Africa. Regarding the 2030, the hydrogen plan was approved based on a strategy of a 10%, around 10% of what wanted to be achieved at the European level in terms of terabytes or gigabytes, four gigabytes were proposed for Spain and the distribution was according to hydrogen consumption, technological clusters and the areas of production and the capacities of the areas. It was interesting to bear in mind that the 25% minimum was established because hydrogen is already being consumed in Spain, but this hydrogen comes from fossil fuels. This hydrogen is considered gray hydrogen. It's interesting to know that this goal was set, but no analysis was done in terms of what sectors are consuming this hydrogen, which would be petrochemical sectors and the recent sectors. So we should take Let's take one step further in terms of analysis and model change, changing the consumption model, changing the energetic model, deciding what sectors we would like to see stay, and in terms of carrying those energies, also how we want it to be done. After the population of group our EU, after the start of the war in the Ukraine, we have been hearing the mantra that Spain is one of the countries in the EU that has the most potential in photovoltaic and wind and renewable energies. So it has also one of the biggest potentials in the product, potential of production of hydrogen production. So we are going to start a hub. We're going to become a hub for hydrogen energy export for the rest of Europe and for the rest of the world. So in front of this view, we are facing like a fever of the green hydrogen. I wanted to point out this of information that I, uh, data that I think is in, uh, interesting because a bubble has been generated around this energetic vector. At the end of 2022, precisely the projects that were put on the table not approved, but 
proposed or presented had the goal the gigabytes projected were four times the goal Spain had set for 2030. It is mainly the big energy companies and those linked to fossil fuels that are behind these projects. Repsol, Petronop, Cepsa, Endesa, or Enagas, the one in charge of transportation of gas in Spain. How are these projects financed? We are seeing how many of them are directly being financed privately with no public subsidies, but there are also some public subsidies in the sector, and we can see how we so some the innovation or technology areas are benefiting from European funds like the PCIs with a total of 74 million euro with the recovery funds. Next, the next generation funds in Spain have a specific chapter for the development of hydrogen with a total of 1,500 million euro for a bid for four billion with some pioneer projects focused on industrial procedures to provide for industrial processes. We will mention one of them later. And then 250 million, which are distributed in the value chain. But it's not just green hydrogen production that we're talking about. We're also talking about the strong transportation. This is where we're seeing also a presentation of a series of projects, which is uh, very relevant and uh, which is uh, very important. Within this green hydrogen fever that we are seeing, our context is a context where the climate and energy national plan is being reviewed and very soon the Spanish plans and strategy is going to be reviewed as well. A series of criteria and objectives are being overdimensioned and this is harming the transition because this is not an answer to the real needs that we have. It's all focusing on a big speculation ball of projects, of non-sustainable projects, as usually, which go almost against the green ecological transition. So I would like to pay attention, special attention to one of them, to complement the cases that our Chile colleagues might tell us about. And I would like to tell you about the CEPSA project in the Andalusian Valley of Hydrogen. These are two projects that want to install up to one gigabyte of electrolyzer in which a project focusing on the production of synthetic fuel or mainly planes and also ship and also ammoniac. There's a first agreement in some agreement memorandums which have taken place with the Rotterdam port in order to carry, so to, to establish some sea car corridors which will go directly from Andalusia, Spain to the port of Rotterdam to carry that green hydrogen, which would mean plan the reduction of uh, or the creation also of uh, wind energy and solar energy of uh, three gigabytes. We were, we were talking about the production of hydrogen, PMIs at the European level. This is pending resolution still, but funds have been asked to develop it. One of the parts is in San Roque, Cádiz, and Andalusia has already been awarded 
in up to 13 million euro for its development as we were saying with our colleagues from Ecologists in Action, there are still no evidence that it's going to, there's possibilities of its development. There are other projects that are fighting for the market, fighting to find their space there. What is most interesting in this question is that there are other projects in other countries, such as the Cinesport in Portugal, that have also reached agreements that have agreed with Port of Rotterdam to for the transportation of hydrogen in the form of ammoniac. Also, Saudi Arabia has reached agreement with this Port of Rotterdam to carry green hydrogen to Rotterdam, as well as Chile. So once again, instead of planning, instead of a correct dimension in of looking at the real needs and looking at how we want to do this transition, we are finding a speculative market operating and similar situations are now happening also with the liquid gas and the high costs that we are suffering because of it. this. Regarding the projects for the transportation, we can see how this house is being started by the roof with the places where hydrogen should be locally produced because it's much more efficient and much more dimensioned and much more in accordance with the local needs or the needs of the sector. What we find is the opposite case. We're going to be producing as much green hydrogen as possible in order to export it, carry it outside, and we are going to focus on exports. So all of these projects on the right hand side of the screen or the, of the slide are a part of the PCI bits, and they would be covering the 50% of the EU finance project. So for the rest of the cost of these infrastructures, that we do not need. Who's going to pay for this? Who's going to benefit? Is it going to be the consumers? Is it going to be the state? It's not going to be the companies that we know. Another thing we know is that it is finally same old, the same old companies that we're working with Gazan that are trying to do some kind of green washing, seeing that their business model is coming to an end. So they're trying to migrate to renewable gas, or at least they're trying to do that green washing for their business model so that they can keep on operating with fossil fuels. Barmar was mentioned before. I wanted to say something about this. In theory, the goal of Marra would be to transfer 2 million tons of hydrogen a year in 2030, which would involve installing 40 gigawatts of renewable energy, additionally to those that are already put in place on the territory, which would mean doubling the PN. I goals in different in the different Spanish territories there are conflicts already happening this would add more tension to these conflicts and it would overcharge the area of Aragon which finds itself in a very complex situation socially speaking this would be one of the impacts this so overdimensioned renewable energy implantation with a big social fracture, with a loss of energy, but not only that, but also in order to 
for these new photovoltaic or when plants to be installed, materials are needed. Critical minerals are being are needed. So extractivism is being promoted in this case as well. Another of the case that has been mentioned and, and that video was mentioning, the video mentioned about nine tons of water for to produce one ton of hydrogen, depending on the mm, technology, it could be even more. It is very important in the case of the Spanish state and the case of the Spanish state, bearing in mind the chronic drought and long-term drought that Spain is suffering where we don't have many water reserves for the summer, facing a climate emergency where the situation is going to even become worse in the Spanish state, we should be very careful with our water resources. It is true that agriculture is the sector using the most the biggest amount of water, depending on where these renewable hydrogen projects are installed, that could mean great impacts on the area. So we should be very careful when planning. Civil society should pay attention to these projects and uh, they should keep a close eye and do some screening on these projects because one of the dangers we can find is that a lot of public money will be invested in the sector and that it will end up being uh, just one bubble or one more speculative mechanism. Finally, I would like to say that what we are seeing with this hydrogen for all, which sounds like the magic solution for the transition, for the ecologic transition, what we need to understand is that the big powers, the big energy powers, the big companies from fossil fuels and oligopolies are the ones that have the economic resources you know that can develop this green hydrogen projects this is why the solutions are not distributed they are focused on them a more participative and inclusive approach would be better like energetic communities with a more direct involvement by the civil society and citizen initiatives. We need a social debate for this. What are the energy sectors, the industrial sectors that are needed for the future? And this is where the key for everything is. Once we know what the social debate will be, just like we did during the pandemic times, when identifying what the essential jobs were in order to achieve a good energetic transition and meeting the climate goals and keep in order for us to keep on living in a world that in a planet that's still worth living in we need to transform those sectors that are essential for life and in order for us to do that with these uses of hydrogen need to be very well defined dimension otherwise we're just going to change one molecule for another and the system will continue turning the wheel in the same sense so thank you very much and i am at your service and available for your questions or comments thank you marina for your presentation i think it has been detailed and i think you answered all the questions that had been asked to you, which was not easy. I think it's right now, we have 61 people in the audience. Thank you to all of you for following this. I wanted to remind you that you can write your questions in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. Our colleagues are taking notes and they will later be read out to the speakers. I will now give the floor to Natalia. And my questions for Natalia will be very similar to the ones I asked Marina, but more focused on Chile. Chile, can you please tell us about the context and situation of Chile, the situation where you 
are living and what is the role of hydrogen in the energetic transition of Chile? Do we have a strategy for it, its development? Second, what actors are you going to be financed? Can you mention the project that is already underway in Chile? And finally, what are the main impacts that are planned for the green hydrogen transition in the territories where they are being um, worked on? Well, thank you very much. Thank you to the ODG for having invited me to participate in this activity. I will share my screen with you. I have a presentation to better illustrate what the situation is regarding the expansion and the impact of the green hydrogen transition. So to start answering your question, Josep, and for you to understand the general context of our territory, Chile is leading the development of green hydrogen in Latin America. I'm going to give some keys like an introduction for us to understand this. It is aiming at producing the green, the cheapest hydrogen in the world for 2030 and to place itself among the three main global producers for 2040. This industry is being promoted by the state with the support of foreign governments, mainly the European Union, such as the Netherlands, Germany, and also Spain. Green hydrogen could displace mining as the main economic activity of the country. For those of you who don't know it, Chile is a deeply mining country, lithium, rare earths, etc. So the fever provoked by this industry is contemplating billions of dollars in investments, is leaving the debate of the great social ecological impacts aside and the need to consult the communities. Why Chile? Why Chile? The vocation of being the laboratory for many things is now making us become a laboratory of green capitalism. conceiving all businesses of energy transition as a new way of accumulation, new form of accumulation. We are number one Latin America in renewable and energy investment and investments, particularly solar and wind energy. Um, industries, we also producing the cheapest hydrogen in the world as we can see in this image according to the source to source a McKinsey and co we would be able to produce hydrogen for less than 1.5 dollars per kilo per kilogram in chile in 2020 under pinera second mandate they had the national strategy for green hydrogen and the main target for 2025 was to become the first country, the top country with investing in green hydrogen, having a cap capacity of five gigawatts and producing 200 kilotons of green hydrogen a year. And at least two locations that I'll mention. And then by 2030, Chile wants to be the global leader of greenhouse of uh, green hydrogen and byproducts uh, for exports it wants to be the cheapest hydrogen producer in the country and a global producer of hydrogen through electricity it's a business worth billions of dollars there are opportunities for private investment mounting to 200 billion US dollars. Uh, this is a figure, uh, 200 billion dollars, that is for 2035, with accumulated investment of up to 330 billion US dollars by 2050, 
and this would represent around 10 percent of Chile's GDP by 2050. So who are the sponsors behind this industry as well? It's mainly the companies that have developed in the energy sector, conventional energy sector. They have set up different consortia to join the industry. Just to name a few, we have Energie from France, Enel, Siemens, Hydrogène de France, Mitsui, NIX, and AES Corporation. And just to tell you about the role played by the European Union when boosting this industry between 2021 and the 2022, the Energy Ministry signed agreements with the ports of Hamburg, Rotterdam, and Ambers uh, for the import of synthetic uh, fuels produced from green um, hydrogen in Chile. Then in 2022, the EU High Representative Josep Borrell presented the Team Europe Initiative for the development of green energy uh, hydrogen in Chile to boost cooperation and create favorable conditions for the development of the industry in Chile to promote investment opportunities in the country and to provide technology and expertise from Europe. They will also facilitate uh, loans to different companies and for export. It's also important to mention the role played by multilateral development banks in this industry. In COP27 in Egypt, the Inter-American Development Bank uh, pledged a loan of 400 million US dollars to support the development of the sector together with another one for technical cooperation amounting to 200 million, 200,000 dollars. The World Bank granted a loan to the Core for National Agency for $350,000 million. Then at the end of 2022, the Inter-American Development Bank and the Green Climate Fund announced the creation of a mobile electronic mobility program for sustainable cities in Latin America and the Caribbean with a fund of $450 million US million to promote electric mobility and green hydrogen in Chile and eight other countries in the region. The IFC is looking at financing pilot projects in, in the country and the Asian Investment and Infrastructure Bank has expressed its interest in investing in the sector in Chile. What are the risks and impacts? Well, in this regards, Marina showed us quite a good overview of the risks and impact of the production of green hydrogen in the territories. So I perhaps would focus on local impacts in Chilean territory. These risks and impacts are mainly linked to the activities linked to the generation of renewable energies, uh, the water supply, the construction and operation of electrolysis plants, as well as uh, the operation of other facilities and infrastructures related to this. The typical infrastructures linked to green hydrogen projects are uh, solar and wind farms, transmission lines, electrolysis units, also desalination plants, which have a huge impact on marine ecosystems, ports and pipelines. They are widespread impacts and they change depending on the location, the size and the final product, including the typical damage to civil works, productive processes, with a special mention, as Marina said, to the quality and quantity of water that would be used, as well as the cumulative impacts, considering the complexity and interrelationship of the different elements that make up the industrial poles of the so-called green hydrogen valleys. This is according to 
a publication by the World Bank from 2022. It's important to highlight what these valleys really mean. They're large extensions of terraces. There's a generation of large scale renewable energies. And at the same time, there's the distribution to the hydrogen production plants. It also affects the territories of indigenous peoples. And in Chile, this is a very important matter. And I will be referring to this uh, in, a, in a short while. But there are projects planned throughout Chile, and most of these projects will be done in indigenous peoples, and they are not being uh, consulted, and they're not being asked for their uh, prior consent. There will be involuntary resettlements, there will be huge impacts on biodiversity, and there will be an important demand of water resources for the production, and this comes at a great cost. Chile has designated two poles for the development of green hydrogen, even if there are other projects in other parts of the country. This is the Antofagasta region in the large north and the region of Magallanes in the southern tip of the Chilean Patagonia. Why these areas? Well, because these areas hold a huge potential when it comes to producing renewable energies. In the north, there is a high potential for solar energy and wind energy. Uh, uh, in Antofagasta, mainly it's wind energy. But there are also territories with a low populational density, meaning there are vast territories to develop these projects. As for the southern province in Magallanes, this is favorable to the creation of large wind farms, according to the uh, statements of the current president, Boric, it could meet 13% of global fuel demands. It is estimated that in this region, they could build 2,900 wind generators occupying an area of 150,000 hectares in areas with a very high ecological and landscape value. We're talking over the Patagonia, which is a part of the country with the greatest uh, landscape uh, heritage in the world. And in the case of the region of Antofagasta, which is uh, the one I've followed more closely because of my profession, the hydrogen projects will be located in historical sacrifice grounds of the, like Topo, Tocopilla and Mejillones, uh, where um, conventional energy have been uh, produced for a long time with thermal electric plants. Um, for around three decades, they produce energy there to supply the mining industry and the communities have had to live with very high levels of pollution caused by the generation of uh, thermal power plants with very high rates of mortal mortality and mobility, also serious disease to the population, such as cancer, um, vascular disease. And these activities also affect the livelihoods of the population living in the area, everything having to do with small-scale fishing. And it weakens the social fabric because uh, the companies operating in these territories, they break the social fabric and cohesion. Here we see a picture from a recent uh, news item shared by Marcelo. I'm sure Marcelo will be able to explain this better than I can. But the government is, uh, Rotterdam signed an agreement with the city of Mejillones to promote the uh, settling of companies in the territory. And they will be using the same infrastructure that has been used up until today for the thermal power plants. It's the same actors, the same companies, they're just changing their business portfolio. 
And I wanted to take an instant, to, a moment to look at the projects that have been approved in the Antofagasta region. There's a project from the French company NG in the Tocopilla community to produce ammonia. This project was done after uh, adopting an, an environmental impact assessment, but with no consultation with or participation of the citizens or the indigenous peoples. And this project is for the production of hydrogen and ammonia. And the ammonia will then be distributed to Mejillones through a 200 kilometer long pipeline to the port of Angamo. The other project that has an environmental impact assessment license was obtained in an even more obscene way. They just expanded the license with no prior study. It's a project of a subsidiary of AIS uh, Chile, that corporation that has uh, thermal power plants in Mejillones, and there they'll be producing hydrogen to fuel their own business. In any case, it doesn't just affect the communities of Tocopillo and Mejillones, the whole of the region is under threat here. They're developing a new coal in the Altalpa Pozo area, which is in the southern part of Antofagasta. And there is a thermal power plant there, but the level of intervention is much lower. And the ecosystems, or well, we still have uh, virgin ecosystems. And this obviously raises great concerns amongst the Chango people because Taltal Paposo is a territory with uh, that has been lived in by the Chango people for more than 10,000 years. There are 15 projects for uh, renewable energies that have been approved, seven are uh, in the final stages, and there's been no prior consultation, no due process, and these projects would have a huge impact on the wildlife and the plants in this um, areas full of archaeological sites and indigenous aerial grounds and um, for the local authorities and the companies they couldn't care less there have been ca documented cases of bad practice where signatures have been falsified where local communities have been harassed the the chango indigenous communities are fearing what may happen when it comes to the green hydrogen sector and the energy transition, and they fear that they will face the same, a similar situation to that in Tocopilla and Mejillones. I hope I've answered your question, Josep. That is what I prepared. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Natalia. I think you did. You did a wonderful job answering the questions that I asked you and you gave us an excellent description of the situation in Chile with all of the different elements. I think it was interesting to give some background as well because most of the people participating here online are, I guess are from Europe. So knowing a bit about the Chilean context is uh, very welcome because we don't have in-depth knowledge. So uh, thank you for that. And thanks for allowing us to learn about the situation in Chile. And next I'd like to give the floor to Marcelo Silva. And I'd like to ask Marcelo a couple of questions uh, in about his situation of the Chango people in the Antofagasta region. The first thing we consider that would be important would be for you to tell us a little more about the Chango people, what are the territories you live in and what is your way of living. We'd also like to know what are the impacts you've lived 
from the economic and energy model in the Antofagasta region. Also, what is your relationship with the local and state authorities and administrations? And last but not least, how do you believe the development of green hydrogen will affect your region and your communities? Good afternoon and apologies for the delay. I'm in a city, I'm used to living in my small village, but I'm now in the city because I had to do some paperwork. So please apologize if my quality sound quality is not good because there's a lot of noise. I'm walking in the street. So I'd like to start off by saying that we are the oldest indigenous people in Chile. And we were the last in gaining recognition. It was just recognized as an indigenous people in 2019. And therefore, several authorities pretend that they don't know. And a lot of things have been signed before 2019, including the projects for the green hydrogen. There are projects that were signed before 2019. So they hide behind that to justify the fact that they didn't hold consultations with the indigenous community. And I mean, things are done behind closed doors and those who are harmed the most are the last to find out of all of this information. In any case, as an indigenous people, we are working in Tocopillas in the second region, all the way to the fifth region in Valparaiso. And uh, that is where we are mainly located, especially in the second region in Taltal was where the movement started. We have our brothers who were accredited by the government and trained by the communities. But all of this has been very slow with a lot of paperwork. Up, and actually up until today, We've been fighting actually since 2019 to accredit uh, people from the second region. I mean, those of us who are affected by these mega projects and everything linked to green hydrogen. Our relationship with the authorities in Mejillones is non-existent or very bad. The mayor we have, who's called Marcelino Carvajal, I th think he was, he could just be another member of the European states. I mean, he spent the past years in the Netherlands signing agreements, selling away our people living on the coastline. And you know, the same with the French companies like Engie of Sikin. I don't know if they uh, have some ties. So we have huge difficulties when it comes to having a relationship with local authorities. I mean, local authorities act just like any other company. And it's shameful because, again, it's our people who are stepped on. We have no, well, nobody who can help us to make our voices heard as indigenous peoples. All we are asking for is for our voices to be heard and to have some respect. There's no reason why we should change our way of living in exchange for the interests of just a few. And our vision uh, is to continue making ourselves known and we are always grateful for these opportunities, especially international opportunities, so that they hear of our problems, so that they can stand in our shoes, in our place. And it's regrettable that comrades of ours or sick um, um, people of our, around us are giving us away and stepping on us in the way they are. I don't know if anyone has any questions. I don't know if I spoke very quickly or if I was audible. Marcelo, thank you so much for this explanation. I wanted to ask if you could tell us a little more 
about how the energy model and development model for the Antofagasta model affected you even before this new push for green hydrogen. How does it affect your cosmic world view and ways of subsistence in the Tango people so that we can hear? Well, I mean, what's happening is very pitiful. We are, it, of, it is often said, we are the capital of energy. Gran Mejillon is the second region. We are 18 kilometers in a, as a bird flies from the six or seven thermal power plants in Mejillones. But we still need to use electric generators. And because of other bad relationships we have with our men, this generator was a municipal energy uh, generator, and the mayor took away the generator, so we have no electricity in our community since January 23rd this year, and no one has taken any interest in us, and although there's a lot of saying that the region we live in is the capital of energy, but nevertheless, they're incapable of supplying energy to a community that is just 17 kilometers away from these mega projects. Um, but they want to become the uh, global exporters of energy, but they don't supply energy at home. We also have eviction problems. They want to evict us. Um, it's the companies that are governing first, and then comes the communities, and last, at the bottom, come the indigenous peoples. So our only energy is our will. This is all the energy we have. Thank you, Marcelo, for sharing. We have now a space for questions and answers. But if you want to later add anything, later on that you might remember later, you can add it later. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. Great. Okay, I was going to start reading some of the questions you've written on the question and answer box. There are quite a few. Some of them are addressed to any of the speakers. Some are addressed to a specific speaker. For example, Some of the questions were referring to the alternatives. One was referring to the deployment of the hydrogen industry in the sense that uh, we need to have a transition and stop depending on fossil fuels. How fossil fuels, how can this industry be developed in a sustainable way so that it will generate new job posts and also answer the needs of some industries, but in a sustainable way. Another specific question was whether any of the speakers know of a study or research about ESOI or ESOI, OEI, energy stored and energy invested of green hydrogen and also alternatives, less centralized technologies that would allow more social autonomy. So which would be the energetic alternatives less centralized to that would allow greater social autonomy? This would be for Marina and for, and also for Marina, in which cases would, uh, would ecologists, in which cases would it make sense for ecologists to use green hydrogen? Also, for Marina, where will Chile be exporting hydrogen and with which additional transportation costs? For Natalia, in Antofagasta, these projects will also uh, be there with the Antofagasta projects with a 
lithium extraction projects in the region and other projects, the extraction of other minerals. Marina, maybe I can give you the floor first and then after Marina, Natalia. Thank you very much. I will start with the sectors where we crisis in action. We know that hydrogen can make sense, not only which sector, but how. It's not just what can be done, but how we can do it. Starting from the basis that a reduction of the energetic cost is necessary, we need to rethink our consumption system, our way of transporting it and carrying it, etc. Where we see that green hydrogen can have some use is some sectors which are very difficult to decarbonize. For example, the steel sector. We need steel for the green transition. We need to reuse it, but of course, it needs to be produced in a certain way, and hydrogen is being used as part of that productive procedure. Hydrogen from gas, from fossil fuels, is being used. Green hydrogen could be used in the sector. Another of the sectors where it should also be, we could explore would be the ceramics sector. There's an important area in the Levante area in Spain with a lot of ceramic industry. We should also see how hydrogen, green hydrogen could be used there in that area. Another of the sectors that is producing a lot of debate is fertilizers. How are we tackling the transition in general in the agricultural sector? Are we willing to make a change towards agroecology, towards a new way of working, land regenerating the soil with much less emissions, with much less chemical fertilizers and pesticides? Um, where a good soil work could be carried out, or should we change that for an intensive production of ammoniac, green hydrogen, using that more in so this, this is what we need to think in all the sectors. What can be done? Which paths, which situations can be presented in our current? market models or models need to be transformed for more social and sustainable models. Another interesting thing to think about is maritime transport and aviation transferred by air. They could also be using hydrogen, sustainable fuel. Our opinion is that first reduction must be a priority. So stay landed in the case of aviation and transportation by air and going back to locally grown or locally produced models so that global transportation can be reduced. So reduce, relocalize, reformulate the economy, different ways of doing tourism appropriate and compatible with the planet and anything that cannot be reduced, then we can develop it as hydrogen-based fuels, but always prioritizing the reduction. Maritime and air companies are trying to prioritize offer a technological model in the long term or in two or three decades those goals can be achieved after the carbon thresholds are achieved. Also, the working hours need to be reduced so that this qualified work can be redistributed among the biggest amount of people, the biggest number of people, so that as many people as possible can live, afford to um, have a, a good um, source of living and, and Natalia you can answer it as well if you like 
Relating to the first question, I think I was talking about that in my presentation, but I can say that again. The main interested parties with whom Chile government has already signed with an agreement are European countries in the north of Europe, of Germany, the Netherlands, Germany, among them, because they have a very serious problem. They don't have their own sources of energy, so they are putting a lot of pressure on developing countries. And I'm going to share a story with you. A week ago, a Changa leader, renowned Changa leader, was in a meeting with the German ambassador and the ambassador asked her, why are you complaining to us? We don't have any German companies operating on the territory because that is true. They are operating on the Magallanes region or other territories in Chile, but not in the that region. And she said, the reason is because you are going to be buying hydrogen from us. So it was a self obvious question. So she felt that she was laughing in her face. She maybe thought that she didn't have a, I mean, because she maybe she thought because she was an indigenous person, she didn't have a brain to think or she didn't have the training or uh, that she wouldn't understand the situation. And the lithium is a similar case. The lithium is, is in the region of Atacama, uh, the Andin Alps region. And the Atacama region is the most exploited one in terms of lithium at the moment. Geographically, it is at a considerable distance from the coast. However, that region is being, and it was historically impacted by the extractive emotions of different metal extractivism and non-metal extractivism, copper, now lithium, and all of those prime materials embarking in the Mejillones and Pupilla ports. The same places where hydrogen is going to be coming out of. So there is a direct relationship here. And the implications of the use of um, ammoniac as well in that region, there's circle of hydrogen and the mining, there's a direct connection between both. The question around Magallanes, it was the declaration by Gabriel Boy, the president, I imagine that you must have your own sources. The second part of the question, I don't understand well. I don't think I understand the second part of the question properly. Thank you very much. Let us have a second round of questions. There's new questions being asked right now. The first one was addressed to Marcelo. It is a very specific question to you, Marcelo. How did you find out about the existence of the green hydrogen projects? What was the information that reached you and by whom? What do you think we should do from Europe? Thank you very much. And I am going to launch some questions in general that have reached us. One about the development of the hydrogen market, explain that it is being developed more quickly in offer than in demand. So if we, if we are aware about the assets that we produce, that can be produced in Chile and Spain and the debt that this can mean for consumers. Also, what are the specific actions that can be taken in order to diversify the possibilities of energetic transitions in the fight against the European hyper-technological vision? And also a reflection of the position that some NGOs are, big NGOs, are taking this problem with the affected communities and peoples. Their position is not being very clear 
they're falling into considering not very substantial green criteria. So how to support, how can we support the resistances from here? And this could be a question for Marcelo as well. And another question yet for Marcelo. Could you share some perspectives of how the Chango people would like to manage its territory and its energies? How do you envisage a healthy relationship among the peoples, the energies surrounding them and the other peoples? Thank you very much. Marcelo, you have the floor. And Marina and Natalia can also answer to the more general questions that have been asked. You can do so as well. It was thanks to Natalia that we heard about this. This is how we realized about this project because we didn't know about this or any other things that were happening, things that are oppressing us. So it was thanks to Natalia that we received the information and we were introduced to people like you Thanks to her, we have been able to become aware, together with our brothers and sisters in the region, that this is what's happening about the energy right now. I'm here right now because we are given the responsibility to train that the other people co energetic cooperative so that we can be self-sustainable. So we are asked to train the fishermen and the other members of the community so that we can deliver energy to our peers. However, it's not the authorities or the companies that are coming to help, that are coming to support us. We ourselves are going to try and find out how we're going to give energy to an area where there are children, grandparents, moms, and workers. What were the other questions, sorry? So about the energetic development, how is this interacting with your way of subsistence of your source of income? In the Shanga community, we are, how can we call this? We are not a priority for the authorities and even less for the companies. They are mentioning uh, the peoples, the, indig the indigenous people in the Altiplano region, and they have been collaborating with them for a longer time. They have more international. Uh, they have received the respect and the help of, of, of international sources. The, people, the indigenous people in the highlands, but not us and the coast in the coastal areas. So this is becoming difficult for us because where the ports are, from which come this green hydrogen, this community should also be protected. They should have their own energy and light, but this is not how it works. They don't care if communities need to be moved from one place to another so that the project will prevail. They do it no matter what. And it's quite pitiful. We would like to be capacitated and uh, we should, uh, we'd like to receive the collaboration and the support that our um, Friends from the Highlands are receiving so that our cause is also more visible internationally. Thank you, Marcelo, for sharing your situation and your experience. 
the situation where you find yourself right now, as I said before, it's important for people in Europe to be aware of what of your situation. Marina and Natalia, would you like to answer to those last questions? Otherwise, we will start our concluding words for the webinar. So about those last questions, about the last actions that we can take, for me, it's always important to start from collective action. And this is we we will find organizations or people that will be capable of following, doing follow-up of those projects so that they meet, with that they comply with sustainable requirements and to see whether they have a decarbonizing future so that green hydrogen will be used in a proper way or are we in front of clouds or bubbles in the air that we need to point at. So we need to avoid that public funds will be financing those projects because we don't have a lot of resources and we have very big needs for transformation. So in that sense, we need hard work on the streets as well. We need, for example, H2 Met and Barmar to come back to people's awareness so that there will be an understanding of critical capacity of what these projects can mean at the level of the impact on the territory, at the level of those associated impacts associated to the production of renewable energies. So we need a social mobilization around these issues and concerning the question about the assets. It's one of the problems we have, the stranded assets that we have. It's one of the problems we have. We will see when they materialize. Of those that are materialized, which will be profitable, which will not be profitable. Are they just greenwashed? Are they just a cover? So we need to follow up those financing projects. Maybe those next generation funds are debt for the future. You maybe you know more about this than me. Um, we need to be cautious because in some projects where European funds are placed, they we should make sure that they are building a um, future and not leaving debt for the future. Natalia, if I'd love to listen to what you have to say about this. I'd like to add to the words said by Marcelo on the impacts of the Chango people. The Chango people have always been um, fisher folk, fish harvesters. Uh, they live off ec marine ecosystems, mainly in the front line, in the coastline. In the Antofagasta region, there was a huge number of water desalination projects. 90% of the desalination plants are used for industrial consumption rather than drinking water for human beings. And in this sense, the problem will only get worse. They will need more water for the processes and this comes with two evident um, impacts. On the one hand, the extraction of water, which takes with it a lot of marine biodiversity and larvae that aren't 
recovered the Mejillones Bay is one of the most biodiverse rich in Chile and they've lived 20 years with pipelines sucking out water for the desalination plants. And the other impact is that the brine that is left after the water is desalinated is then thrown back into the sea. And this again alters the marine systems. This affects the availability of resources for the subsistence of the Chango people. The Chango people are fisher folk. Some of them in, um, work in the mining sector, but most of them, the large majority, are fisher folk. And it, these projects have a major impact on their livelihoods. And what I've witnessed through my conversations and discussions with them, what they want, and that is why they wanted to be recognized as an indigenous people, what they want is to stop more mega projects and the impacts on ecosystems, biodiversity and the marine system. So they want to, they work to give visibility to their struggles, to raise awareness on the impacts that green hydrogen projects will have on their lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marina, Natalia, for your contributions for these last questions that were, and now I will switch back into Catalan because we will be wrapping up today's webinar. So first and foremost, I wanted to say that in the chat box, we will be circulating a survey on today's activity. As we said, it's part of a series, a European wide project, and we'd like to hear your thoughts and opinions. It's an optional survey, of course. If you feel up to it, please answer the survey, and we will also send it out by email as soon as we finish today's webinar. And finally, I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to thank our panelists for being with us, who have shed light on the issue of hydrogen and hydrogen-related projects in Spain and Chile, not just the institutional plans, but also the impact that these projects may have on the territories. And in this case, I would also like to thank Marcelo very especially, who shared with us his personal experience and thank him for being able to connect even if he was facing difficult situations. And I'd also like to acknowledge the work of the interpreters who have been with us for an hour and a half, allowing us to hold this webinar in different languages and to allow people from different parts of the world who participate so that we could communicate. And last but not least, I'd also like to thank all of our audience for being here today. And thank you also for your participation. Thanks for your questions, which I'm sure have enriched the session. And answering to Alberto's question, today's was the second webinar. The first was held last Monday on the 15th of May. And the next is, will be on Thursday, June the 1st. So that's all on my side. And thank you all very much for participating.